Hi, this is Kevin from the Mathsaurus, and in this video we're looking at questions 6 to 10 from the Tamua paper from 2019, the test of mathematics for University admissions, putting all of the uh, videos for paper 1 and paper 2 into a playlist. I'm hoping to get finished in time for the 2020 exam, so good luck if you're taking that exam, uh, and uh, perhaps you're taking it in future years, in, in which case it'll all be there uh, already. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll get on with the questions. So in question six, we've got some marking to do. Uh, we've got a student's attempt to this uh, equation, to solving this equation here given. And if we just glance down the answers quickly, what we're asked to do is to either say that the student's answer is correct or to identify when the first error comes in. Um, and that can either be because there's an error in line one, two, or three, or because they've introduced extra solutions in four and five. Um, or because they haven't eliminated values in stage six. Um, but to me, it makes sense just to start at the beginning of this question and work our way through because, you know, if we will either find the first error or we won't. Um, you could also kind of go through sort of checking values in the solution, but I think I'd rather just read through the solution. So um, the student's attempt is as follows. We've got cos x plus sin x tan x equals two sin x minus one. Well, that's just the question, so that's fine. So cos x minus sin x uh, plus sine x tan x minus sine x equals minus one. Well, they've just um, subtracted uh, the two sine x and split it up in, in two. Nothing wrong with that, obviously. Um, now, in part, now from one to two, they've attempted a factorization. And you look at this and you think, oh, hang on. So I've just got to check all the terms here, right? So if I multiply this out, um, I would get a minus sine x, a minus cos x tan x, um, a sine x tan x, and a plus cos x, right? So actually, there's one slightly strange thing about this. There's one thing that doesn't seem to match up, which is the minus sine x and the minus cos x tan x, right? Um, but if you think about it, uh, you know, what is cos x times tan x? Well, if I write it as cos x times sine x over cos x, uh, then we could say that's equal to sine x. So actually, the cos x tan x is, is equal to this sine x, and we've just got to worry here perhaps that this just wouldn't be valid when cos x is zero. Um, but in fact, you don't have to worry too much about that here because for this equation, cos x can't be zero um, anyway because we've got the tan x in the equation, right? So if, if cos x was zero, tan x would be undefined for that value. So this equation would be undefined at that point, so it wouldn't be a solution to the equation. So I don't think we can call that an error for sort of not making that explicit. Um, but we do get a pretty glaring error from two to three, um, because it's definitely not the case that when the product of two factors is minus one, that that means one of the two values has to be minus one, right? This is an argument that only works when you've got zero on the right hand side. Um, so if they're going to try a factoring argument here, they need to first set everything equal to zero. And really, that means we don't have to bother reading the rest of the question here. The absolutely glaring error uh, on, on line three. Um, you might spend a bit of time thinking about whether the thing on line two constitutes an error, but we can pretty much convince ourselves that it's not. And, um, and so, so that's great. Right, um, question seven. For which of the following statements is the fact that 12 squared plus 16 squared equals 20 squared, can it be used to produce a counterexample? So again, if it's going to be a counterexample, it's got to satisfy the premise of the statement, but not the conclusion. Right, so in A, it says if A, B, and C are positive integers that satisfy A squared plus B squared is C squared. Yeah, that works. Here, yeah, they satisfy that. And the three numbers have no common divisor. Ah, okay. Well, the three numbers do have a common divisor here of four. So these numbers don't satisfy the premise. So it can't be a counterexample for A. Right. Um, so in B, it says the equation a to the four plus b squared equals c squared has no solutions for which a, b, and c are positive integers. And you look at this and you think, well, OK, hang on, we've been given a squared plus b squared equals c squared here, right? There's no fourth power, is there? Well. The thing is, there is a fourth power in here because 16 is in itself a square number, right? So 16 squared, we could write as 4 to the 4, and all I've got to do is just change the order, and I'd get 4 to the 4 plus 12 squared equals 20 squared, right? So this equation does have a solution for which a, b, and c are positive integers. We found it here, 4, 12, and 20. And 
Um, and so this can be used as a counterexample here. So the answer to this question is B. Now you might have a slight hesitancy because of the way they've written it out here, right? Because they haven't actually kind of explicitly written it in the form of the premise here. Um, so you m would be, I'd forgive you here for, uh, for at least checking C and D to make sure um, they can't be used either. Uh, C is a special case of um, Fermat's Last Theorem. Um, look up Simon Singh's book, you can, uh, you can buy it in my Amazon store if you want to know more about that theorem, a very famous theorem in maths. But uh, you know it says the equation a to the 4 plus b to the 4 equals c to the 4 has no solutions for which a, b and c are positive integers. Um, so that's, that's actually just a true statement because Fermat's last theorem says this is true for any, you know, even if I change this these in to 3 or 5 or anything bigger than 2, we can't verify higher versions of Pythagoras' theorem. Um, but uh, but even then, we can, and so we can see this isn't, this doesn't work here because 16, uh, although 16 is a square number, 12 and 20 aren't, so we can't rewrite 12 and 20 as fourth powers anyway, so we can't, we can't form this one into the, uh, you know, into, into this shape. And indeed it says if a, b and c are positive integers which satisfy the equation a squared plus b squared is c squared, then one is the arithmetic mean of the other two. Well, um, here it satisfies the premise, but it also satisfies the conclusion because um, 16 is the arithmetic mean of uh, 12 and 20, so it's not D, and so we can definitely say the answer must be B here. Right, question 8 says A, B and C are real numbers with A less than B less than C less than 0, and we want to know which of the following statements must be true. Now, um, you know, it's saying that they must be true, so doing it with an example is not is not really enough here, but there's no harm in having some sort of example in mind here, just to kind of check a little bit whether you know to get your head around these things, and then to think if it's always true, right? So like, I, you know, maybe let's just take a really easy version here, where like a is minus three, b is minus two, c is minus one, right? Um, is it the case that a times c is less than a times b is less than a squared? Well, okay, a squared is the only positive. Uh, well, no, sorry, it's not the only positive number here. Um, they're all positive numbers, in fact, right? Because a times c, a times b because a, b, and c are all individually negative, so these are all products of two negative numbers, right? So, um, so a squared here would be one, sorry, uh, would be nine, um, a times b would be six, and uh, a times c would be three, right? And so we can see that it does work for those values, and then if you think about it, it is gonna work for all values here, because basically a is, uh, you know, a is in all of these, right? And so if C is uh, like the, um, the the largest, so this is the confusing thing, right? Because C is the largest of these three numbers, but it's the but it's the smallest in magnitude, right? Like minus one is actually the largest out of these three numbers, but it's the smallest in magnitude. So so when I multiply each of these three numbers by the number a minus three, right? Um, then a times C ends up being the smallest one a times b is the next smallest one, and a squared is the next smallest one. And we can kind of see without making any formal argument here that uh, that, that it's going to work for all numbers. You could just take the inequality a is less than b is less than c is less than zero uh, and multiply it through by uh, a as well, right? And then you'd get a squared here, a b, and a c. And because a is a negative number, we need to flip the sign of the inequality. And so we can convince ourselves that that statement uh, is true as well. So one is true. Um, in two, well, this is the probably well, this is the easiest case, I guess. B is uh, negative. C plus A is negative because both C and A are negative. So when I multiply them together, I get a positive number. Yeah, that's true. And in part three, um, if I just look at my example here, C over B is um, going to be uh, 1 over 2 and a over b is going to be 3 over 2 and so actually my example here <laughs> breaks this straight away and in fact any choice of a, b and c would also break it so um, you don't have to make a more rigorous argument here we're just trying to show that it's not definitely true um, so 3 doesn't work so actually having an example here in mind is pretty good because it is not a bad way of doing these questions because it can eliminate things quickly and it can give you a bit of intuition and and help into the question, right? Even if even if a formal answer would would look something more like this. Anyway, 
We've got the answer there. It is that one and two must be true. So the answer is E. Question nine, we've got a large circular table with 40 chairs around it. And we want to know what the smallest number of people who can be sitting at the table already, such that the next person to sit down must sit next to someone. Now, I actually misread this question first, and I thought, what well, the, the I was looking at the largest number, saying, okay, I'll just, okay, uh, initially I said, oh, let's just alternate them all, right? But actually, it's the smallest number of people who could be sitting at the table so that the next person must sit down to someone, next to someone, right? So we're saying, like, imagine we wanted to sort of use people efficiently here and seat them in such a way that, like, we use as few, few people as possible in order to make it so that the next person is going to have to sit next to someone, right? So, so like if I had, let's call this one seat one, so let's just put someone in seat one, doesn't matter where we start. So I could leave seat two empty. Um, now would I put someone in seat three if I was playing this game of trying to use my people most efficiently? Well, no, because I could actually leave two gaps and then put someone in seat four instead. And now, if any, now no one can sit down between them without having to sit next to someone, right? But if I left three gaps and put someone here at seat five, well, actually, I've left this place here and I've got this sort of less efficient way, right? It's not, so I, I'd still have to put one extra person in here to satisfy this, right? So we're basically going to put someone in seat four and then we're going to leave two more gaps and then we're going to put someone in seat seven, right? So what we end up doing is putting people every third seat. So we're going to put them in one, four, seven, ten. 13, 16, 19, 22, 25, 28, 31, 34, and 37, then at some point we're going to get round to seat, so seat 40 would be the next one I might put someone in, right? Um, so we've put someone in 37 here. Actually, uh, you don't have to worry about the fact that that's next to someone. It doesn't, doesn't say we can't put two people next to each other. Um, but we do need to put someone in one of these three seats. And actually, you could put the last person in any of these three, three seats, either 38, 39, or 40, and it would work, right? But we just need to put someone somewhere. So how many do we have to do? Well, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 in this list. And then we need plus one more. Uh, so the answer here is D, uh, 14. So in question 10, we've got PQRS is a quadrilateral labeled anti-clockwise, right? Um, so, I mean, we could just draw a random quadrilateral if we want to. It doesn't, doesn't harm us, I suppose. And we're labeling it anti-clockwise, anti so it's going to be this way around, PQRS, like that. So it says, which of the following is a necessary but not sufficient condition for PQRS to be a parallelogram? Right, so, uh, so we know in a parallelogram we are going to have... Um, two pairs of equal sides, and they're also each of those pairs are also going to be also going to be parallel. Um, so if we had P Q equals S R, so that means two. If I look at my thing here, so P Q equals S R, so two opposite sides are equal in length, and P S is parallel to Q R. Does that mean does that mean it's a parallelogram? Well, it's not too hard to come up with a a case here. Uh, where uh, that's not true, right? I could have two pairs of pa opposite parallel sides and these two sides being equal, and I just get a trapezium, not a parallelogram. Okay, so uh, so certainly A is not sufficient for it to be a parallelogram, right? I'd need something, you know, because I, I can do this and I can just get a trapezium and not necessarily get a parallelogram, right? So this one is certainly not sufficient. Um, is it necessary? So could I have a could I get a parallelogram without this condition being true? Well, if it's a parallelogram, we definitely have to have uh, the opposite sides parallel and the other opposite sides equal length. Right? In fact, both pairs of opposite sides are parallel and of equal length. So uh, so it is necessary, and uh, that means that A is correct. And in a sense, we don't have to go on to do the rest of the question here. I don't have to think about it. Um, but if you want to. Uh, if, you, you know, if you've been thinking about this question on the other ones, let's talk about them quickly. So if PQ equals SR and PQ is parallel to SR. So this time it's saying, well, if uh, two opposite sides are both the same length and parallel, right? So if I've got them parallel and they're the same length, well, that actually that automatically means that the other two sides have to be the same, uh, the same length as well uh, and parallel. So it would be a parallelogram. So actually, uh, so this one is sufficient um, and it's also necessary.
because parallelograms definitely have that property. And um, if PQ equals QR equals SR equals PS, that just means all four sides uh, are the same, are the same length. Um, so, uh, so I get a rhombus for sure. A rhombus is definitely a parallelogram. Uh, so this is sufficient, um, but uh, not necessary because I can have a parallelogram that doesn't have four equal sides. Um, and then PR equals QS, that's saying that the diagonals are of equal length and uh, that one is uh, not necessary for a parallelogram. They don't have to have equal lengths. You can think of a parallelogram that has a very sort of uh, narrow like that, and they're clearly very different lengths. Um, so uh, not necessary um, and certainly not sufficient. Um, so uh, so that one can't be true. Anyway, we've got the answer as A straight away. So if, if you're doing this in real test and you're confident about that, you wouldn't need to spend time thinking about the others. You could maybe mark it and come back to double check later, but I would just be happy with that answer A and move on and spend time on the rest of the paper. So I hope that was useful. Please do like the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Check out the website where there's loads of extra resources and also the Amazon store with lots of recommendations for books and other things that could be great for wider reading for uh, personal statements and just for a general enjoyment of this uh, incredible subject. Um, so uh, good luck with the exam if you're taking it this year or in future years and I will see you in the next video.